Yeah. Okay, great. Um, welcome everyone to Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's second virtual public outreach event of 2021. We are very excited to have you all with us this evening for our event on where they are and how to find them, reveal local turtle distributions with no novel DNA techniques with Wenji Feng from Queen's University. We will be continuing to host these events in the upcoming months, so please stay tuned on Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website and social media. We also invite you to check out the recordings of our past events, which can be found on the official CUBE's YouTube channel. My name is Sabrina Razna, and I'm one of the outreach and teaching interns at the Queen's University Biological Station. Myself, along with Lindsay Ray, the other outreach and teaching intern, and Emily Verhook, the outreach and teaching coordinator, will be facilitating this event tonight. We are so thankful to have you all here with us tonight. And if you wish, please type your name and where you're zooming in from into the chat box, as we would love to know if you're comfortable with sharing. We ask that you please keep your audio and video turned off throughout the webinar and type your questions into the chat box, the icon located at the bottom of the Zoom screen, to either my, everyone or myself, Sabrina Rasna. We will be monitoring this chat box throughout the presentation and we'll have time for a Q&A. Please note that we will be recording this webinar and it will be available after this presentation on the CUBE's YouTube channel in case you need to leave early or wish to share it with your network. So Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Ebel Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is a part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the peoples who lived here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land, and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community, and there are first peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. Before we introduce our speaker, we just want to take a quick moment to get your feedback. A poll will pop up on your screen. Can you please select the answers that relate to you? Okay, did that make everything disappear because I was gone? Oh no, Emily, it's the poll time, the first poll. Oh, great, because I was gone, so. <laughs> Do you want me to launch it or did you guys launch it? Um, you know, we weren't able to launch it, so. Okay, perfect, sorry. My internet decided to kick me off, so I'm glad I got back in time. <laughs> okay. So everyone should be able to see the poll now. Sorry, I disappeared for a minute. We have some varied results, so that's always interesting to me. Oh, Lori, I'm not sure why you can't submit. Weird. Okay, I think that's almost everyone. 
couple more people and then I'll end it. If you've just joined, we're just doing a quick poll to see how you found out about our event. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, answering the poll on your screen, that would be fantastic. Okay, so I think that's everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna end it. So it looks like, Oops. yeah, go ahead. No, oh, no, yeah. go ahead, Sabrina. <laughs> okay, I was just going to say, it looks like a lot of you heard about this program from Facebook, which is really great. And it looks like it's almost kind of near, like how many of you have attended events before or not. So I hope you learn a lot from today's presentation. And everyone, most people seem to have some basic knowledge on this topic. So hopefully um, you will take away a lot from today. And it looks like mostly adults are joining us today. It's awesome to see that there are some children or families, so that's fantastic. Oh, I forgot to share for everyone to see. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. You can take a look now. You should be able to see it. Okay, and um, Wenji can go ahead and share his screen now, correct? Wait, can I introduce him first? Oh, yeah, do that. That sounds good. <laughs> All right, so I'd just like to take a quick minute to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, so Wenji finished his undergraduate degree at Fudan University in Shanghai, China. He met Steve Lahey through his Canada-China field course in 2012 and decided to come to Queens for graduate work. His current PhD research in the Lockheed lab involves using environmental DNA or eDNA to map turtle species distributions in Eastern Ontario and developing eDNA based fish community survey protocols for Eastern China freshwater lakes. So Wenji, we really appreciate you joining us tonight and I'm gonna pass it along to you now. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen right now. Okay. Share. So everything good? Looks okay -ish. Yeah. Looks okay. good. Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome to, to my talk. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about how to use uh, my little my PhD work, uh, our applications of environmental DNA, this novel technique uh, to better understand the distributions of uh, freshwater turtles in Southern Ontario. So I'm gonna start with, a, with this very, uh, they claim kind of one of the biggest challenge uh, in conservation biology and also in ecology uh, is to find a species of interest with higher accuracy and lower cost. So especially for species of conservation concerns and also for species of uh, rare occurrences where they are uh, harder to find with conventional uh, survey methods. And to the topics of turtles, as we indicated uh, by the advertisement, it is one of the most successful stories of, of vertebrate evolution. So turtles have, have been survived and evolved since the late uh, Triassic. So that's about 150, 215 uh, million years ago and have endured many, many geologic, geological events and disasters and survive onto the modern day. And it is very important in a lot of ecologi uh, ecological systems sometimes even play as a keystone species, which is a species that is essential for the entire community to just survive. So here is example, the golfer tortoise in the United States. Uh, the boros constructed by the golfer tortoise uh, provides, um, uh, provides habitat for a myriad of species, both invertebrates and vertebrates. Uh, so it's a good example of how important turtles are to our environments. And also turtles are of cultural importance. Uh, so this is not really okay. So such as food harvesting, medicinal uh, applications, and sometimes even uh, musical instruments. So here is the Greek lyre, lyre instrument. So you can see uh, this instrument is made, basically made, made by uh, a shell of a, a tortoise. And also this uh, uh, is a, a rattle that made by uh, Native Americans using the snapping turtle shell. So it's a, it's a rattle, it's also kind of an instrument. And as we know all know of it, that turtles are 
under risk. So there's a famous kind of this picture that turtles get uh, tangled by the fishing nets in, in the uh, in the in the in the sea, and the turtles are of one of the most endangered group of uh, vertebrates, with about two thirds of the members are now threatened or uh, endangered, and two of the two percent of them are now extinct. And uh, the reasons of uh, the global decline of turtle population, there are many many reasons, including habitat loss, uh, roll kill, uh, human activities, uh, invasive species, and climate change, etc. So actions are needed for turtles for sure because they are uh, relatively. Uh, their response to environmental change are relatively slow. So uh, a lot of, if, if, if they're, they're, they're declining are seem to be more, more worse compared to other groups of animals. And that leads back to our question, how do we find these this, this animals with higher, uh, with higher efficiency, with better tools? So back to this uh, basic question, how many turtles do we have here? Uh, so globally, we have about 360, uh, extent species that are curling in on on in the uh, on Earth, and zooming into North America, we had about so that that only counts uh, United States and Canada, uh, excluding Central America. We have fifty eight species, and eight of them are reached to the northern limit, northern northern latitudes of Canada, and in southern Ontario, normally we'll find eight, uh, five species of turtles. Although we have all eight species of turtles in Canada, but commonly you will find five of them. And here are some pictures of this turtle. So from snapping turtle, which is really common on the road, uh, to blending turtle with a really bright uh, yellow ching on the as, as a, a good, in, good uh, uh, very obvious characteristic of the turtle. And pendy turtle, they are, they are everywhere. So they have this, uh, this uh, light uh, red stripe on the side. And to map turtle, uh, which is gonna be one of the star of today's talk, and to the another species we're going to talk about today is a common mass turtle. So this this five two species of turtles are commonly around in in, in Kingston region or in the southeastern Ontario region. And uh, note that they have different trends tendencies of a terrestrial or or aquatic environment. So from left side the the blended turtle and snapping turtle turtle, uh, they are more terrestrial compared to turtles on the right side. Uh, no, uh, map turtles are more aquatic. And to the to the to the extreme of common master, they are almost entirely aquatic. So there is a trend of uh, preferences of over different kinds of environments. As I mentioned, we live in Canada, uh, which is in high latitude. And we are at the northern range limits of all turtles in North America. So on this uh, slide, I show that there are all the eight species of turtles that we have in the country, and we are about here, uh, here-ish, Southern Ontario. So we are at the Northern Range limits for all these turtles. So we are at, at kind of the front of where turtles can go. So turtles cannot, simply cannot go further uh, due to many reasons I'm gonna really talk about today in today's talk. Okay. So here are some traditional survey methods for aquatic organisms that, that includes turtles, uh, uh, as well. So for staining, you can do this very simple practice where you can catch fish and also uh, turtles can be trapped in the staining nets as well. Uh, you can also do radio tagging where you put a radio tag on the turtles uh, during a certain time of the year, then later you can track with the radio telemetry where turtles are. And finally you can snorkel uh, where in the summertime we are, uh, you can take your brave and master your snorkeling skills and just go into the water and try to find the turtles. So. So all these methods are time consuming, sometimes require expertise. For example, radio tagging is not a, something that normal people can do. And also radio tagging sometimes can cause uh, stress on the turtles. So turtles typ typically, they do not like something stick on the back of them uh, for a year. And also snorkel, uh, especially in the, you know, in the marshland, in a, in a swamp, well, probably not gonna be uh, very pleasant for, to do so. So that's where we are. Uh, exploring how the novel technique environmental DNA or in short eDNA to, can, can help us to uh, better survey these animals and it ultimately help with the conservation of turtles. So for, for those of you are not familiar with the, with the idea of environmental DNA, it is defined as DNA material, so materials, tissues uh, containing DNA uh, molecules released from organisms into the environment. 
such as water, soil, or even in the air. So basically, uh, anything that live in the water, for example, if, if we talk about aquatic environments, that will leave trace of DNA into the environment. So either you you share your skin, your your your, fe uh, your fecal your feces get into the water, or animals die in the water, so their carcasses start to release DNA into the environment. So those those DNA those those material uh, material can be harvested uh, by the novel by our advancing techniques. So we can use the DNA signature to analyze to make uh, inferences of presence absence of species in the environments. So there are many many advantage of this technique. I'm just going to list the two of them. So it's contactless. So we're not big, since we're only dealing with environmental samples, we're not actually touching or contacting the animals. So that will be really valuable uh, for species of conservation concerns. So you, in, in the name of conservation, you do not want to engage with the animals uh, causing stress. And also it's highly sensitive. So it's much more, uh, uh, has, has, more has more much higher uh, sensitivity and response compared to conventional method so it's very efficient for rare species where uh, you, you find very low occurrences of the animals you're looking at so here's a another quick overview of the technique so you can go into different kinds of environments in the in the, in the, in the water uh, in the sediment in the soil or sometimes even in the ice core uh, you can extract dna from those environmental samples then from those dna samples extracted uh, you put into all the fancy uh, fancy machines and techniques, you can analyze whatever species you wanted to do so. Okay, so people have been uh, monitoring invasive species in, in aquatic systems. They can be looking for uh, animals that have been extincted like the mammals uh, using, all the, uh, using the DNA preserved in the environment. So with that little bit of background, I'm gonna talk about two projects of my PhD uh, uh, kind of endeavor. So. One of, the, one of them happens in the winter, the other one happens in the summers. Should cover a nice picture here. So here's first study we're gonna talk about is how to use environmental DNA to detect uh, turtle win uh, winter hibernacular for turtles. Uh, hibernacular is a, is, the, is a term for hibernation sites, okay? So this, is, this, picture, this picture was taken uh, in Lake Penicum. So why do we care about hibernation of turtles? So why does it matter? So first, we'll take, let's take a look at a, a temp temperature profile of Lake Penicum. So from day one to, to the end of the year, you can see the temperature uh, peak at, in the summertime, but in the winter time, it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty cold. If we draw a line around 15, 15 degrees Celsius, uh, that's, where, that's the temperature where we where we're kind of a, uh, typically think that turtles are uh, gonna be less active under that temperature. So, we can see the huge proportion of their lifetime is actually hibernating. So about half of their half of the year, turtles are actually not physiologically active. So during this period of inactivity, so turtles they have different tolerance of anoxia, which is lower low oxygen conditions. Remember, turtles are air breathers, so they are not like fish; they cannot breathe uh, as efficient in the water. So in this period of hibernation because the, the, the water is, is blocked by the ice on top. So turtles have to survive under the water, under the water without access to fresh, fresh air. So two groups of turtles on the left side, we have turtles are, that are intolerant to anoxia conditions, namely spiny soft shell, uh, common mass turtle and northern map turtles. On the right hand side, we have snapping turtles and penny turtles that are quite tolerant to low or no oxygen levels in the, in the environment. So for, for, the, for the turtles on the left side, uh, uh, hibernation can be physiologically challenging because if you are hibernating in the, in a site that do not provide enough oxygen during the winter time, you simply will not survive, right? Mm -hmm. So combine those two, two sides of the story, the availability of hibernation sites actually might limit the presence of certain turtle species. So for example, if you come across a wetland that looks pretty, pretty, pretty good during the summertime, thinking turtles, the northern map turtles might be there, but actually the, tur the map turtles are not there, not because the summer habitat quality, but because that particular wetland do not provide, uh, does not provide any winter hibernation site. Because if, you, if the water is too shallow in the winter, it's just froze, they would just freeze to the bottom, leaving no, no place for turtles uh, to hibernate. So that will give us the question, how can we use environmental DNA to Try to survey uh, 
the hibernation hibernating turtles under the ice uh, during winter. So turtles are when they are hibernating, they are they are generally immobile. They're acting as fixed source of DNA releasing into the environment. And also the wind, the, the water is not really mixing during winter time. So the DNA signals should be quite localized uh, during winter time. Since conventional methods are really not really helpful during winter time because the, the lake is, is frozen and it's covered by ice. So that's little, so can we use environmental DNA to, 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 to tackle this to tackle this problem? So imagine we have this kind of situation. If you are, if where we drill a hole and take water samples, if the water sample is closer to where turtles are hibernating, you are supposed to have higher concentration of environmental DNA, or that's gonna be, or have detection versus no detection where turtles are not hibernating uh, underneath where you took the samples. To answer this question, uh, we studied the species of northern map turtles, uh, which is quite common in Lake Penicum. So a bit more information about this turtle. So they are mid-sized about the size when they are adult. So females are about this size and males are much smaller about that size. Uh, it's commonly found basking in groups during the summertime. Mm. So it is listed as species of con a special concern, a conservation concern in Canada under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, it hibernates through uh, late October to early April on the water. I saw in the chat uh, that map turtles, map turtles are now emerging uh, from their hibernation site at this time of the year. Okay. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, they are intolerant to prolonged period of anoxia condition. Uh, so we conducted this study uh, in Lake Penicum. Uh, we show here. So we we do have a. A, a, a quite a large population of map turtles in this lake, about 1,500 adult individuals that have been monitored and studied in the past decade. So in this lake, we do know there's a one hibernation site uh, around this island called Eight Acre Island. I should have marked this place, but uh, we do have one known uh, hibernation site, and we have another hibernation site right here that we suspect they are hibernating, but we never get confirmed. So I conducted a survey of uh, environmental DNA sampling in the two winters of 2017 and 2018. And we're gonna show you the results right away. Uh, but before I'm gonna show you just quickly how the lake looked like in the winter time. So this is a satellite image uh, taken at this date. Uh, you can see, uh, except some places near Riddle Canal that is open during winter time, the almost entire lake is frozen, okay? So the sampling scheme, uh, the, in the first winter, I took 36 samples across the lake without actually knowing where turtles are hibernating. At the time, I, I had no idea. Then after the first year of sampling, I consulted a, a colleague of mine in Caltech University, Gregory, Gregory Bote. He's the, he's the expert of map turtles on this lake. He told me where he knows turtles are hibernating and kind of matches with, with my detection. So I went on the second winter, I took a lot of more samples across the lake. So this particularly in this Acre Island that we know turtles are hibernating along the shore of the island. I took a lot of more samples and also I down, I down two transects uh, along the, uh, 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 extending from where turtles are observed to be hibernating. And also on to towards the west, south end of, uh, the west end of the lake, there's one site that we suspect turtles are hibernating due to early emergence of turtles in the, in the springtime. Uh, but we never come, we never get confirmed whether, whether or not turtles are hibernating. Just quickly show the results combining two years of data. Uh, so, Around the island that we know turtles are hibernating here, uh, the red dots are detections and black dots are non-detections. So we have a, quite a few detections around the, well, around the island where we know turtles are hibernating and also sort of uh, along the transects. And also we have two out of 10 detections uh, where we suspect turtles are hibernating. So the first finding of the study is that eDNA pattern, signal pattern generally matches with where uh, we know and suspect turtles are hibernating in the lake. So the eDNA, eDNA distribution across the lake and the physical distribution of turtles across the lake that generally uh, matches which is that with each other. And then secondly, uh, if we focus on where we know turtles are hibernating around the island, uh, we can do a very simple uh, mathematical modeling. We can define that the detection probability is dropping alongside uh, along the transects extending from the hibernation site. So that means uh, the further away we get from the island, the, the less likely uh, we will detect DNA uh, from those turtles, which makes perfect sense that uh, 
if we're getting closer to closer enough to the turtles, we have a 50-50 chance of detect the turtle's signal. So it might not seem too high for some of the folks out there, but 50% of detection probability is quite good uh, under such cir cir circumstances uh, uh, for turtles under the X. And also I mentioned I have two out of 10 detections at the site where suspectors are hibernating. So I so with that we conducted an underwater robot survey trying to confirm whether turtles are hibernating uh, during winter time since we we have been, we had suspicions before and also we have uh, EDA detections as well. So we went out to confirm that with the help of oops <laughs> with the help of a underwater robot. So here's the underwater robot. What we did is actually we drive, we draw a horn on the ice and we try to navigate under the water. Uh, we're using the, uh, the robot, which has a uh, camera on board. So we're just trying to find the turtles if we could. So that's the setup for the setup for this expedition. So there's a setup, we draw a hole, they drop the, the underwater robot with his tether to a router. Then you just basically control uh, the robot using your cell phone. Then we, what we did was we drew a hole uh, about 20 meters along the, uh, away from the shore. Then we just go against the shore and trying to scan through the, uh, uh, the, the near the shore area. Since there's no GPS, uh, there's no means of navigation under the, under the ice. So it took a lot of uh, practice to get, to get used to how to drive on the water uh, because there's no reference. It's really kind of hard. So I'm going to show you two footages uh, from from this uh, the survey. So the first footage is where uh, it's taken was taken at where we know turtles are happening. So it's clear we can see there are two female turtles uh, lying on the bottom. There's one male trying to uh, go around and trying to guard the female. So because this is will be their their mate in the, in, the, in the in the springtime. So that's kind of like a test drive for how can we find the turtle turtles using their underwater robot. I'm going to show you another video uh, at the suspected site uh, of turtle hibernation. I was there for about a week trying to find the turtles, uh, but to no avail. But this is almost like a, where I'm trying to um, decide to give up my, my, my try. Then I. So you can see the rocky kind of slope the, where we think turtles are kind of prefer this kind of a. Uh, yeah, that's the turtle. That's a single map turtle I found uh, during that period of time. So it was pretty excited because it sort of comes into reality that uh, we have DNA signals at the site. And after some time and try, and we find a turtle actually hibernating, releasing the DNA into the water. So we, we had, remember, we had two out of 10 detections out of, at the site, and I found there's only one turtle during the period of time. So there might be more, but it seems to be there's a smaller population of map turtles hibernating in this area. Thus the detection probability is also uh, in general lower. Okay, so that concludes the first study. I'm gonna jump into the second study. I wanna leave some time for you guys to uh, for questions and stuff. Uh, second study, what, what, I, what, I, what I did is trying to use environmental DNA to help us to do the niche modeling for turtles the larger area. So in the previous study, I studied this turtle in a single water body, uh, focused in one lake. In this second study, I expand my uh, study area to the Southern Ontario region. So again, a little bit of background about this. Uh, so we have five species of turtles in, that commonly found in this area. And four of them have this, uh, this, this unique uh, behavior for turtles that is basking. So in the, because we know turtles are actotherms, Actotherms, which means they cannot regulate their body temperature by themselves uh, to, to, to a certain degree. So they need to warm themselves up by the radiation uh, by the, from the sun. So in the summertime, all these four different species of turtles, they will come out of water and trying to hang on to a log, to a rock, trying to use the, the, the sun to, to warm themselves up. But we are missing one turtle, right? So there's one turtle that typically do not have this kind of behavior. So they do not come out of water and bask. That is the turtle species we're going to talk about in the next in the next chapter. So in those, so for those turtles that that turtle typically hides under underneath uh, the foliage. So in the summertime, they still need to warm themselves up uh, instead of climbing onto a rock, ex expose them, themselves to danger uh, to predators. What it is, they they try to go to find a very shallow water. They hide themselves underneath the lily pads. 
or they just live a tiny little, tiny little bit of their, their, their shell uh, up above the water. So for this kind of turtles, it's easy to miss those is to miss this turtle. I they're doing 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 my 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 few few works. There's one family I come across. He lives in the cottage. I ask, do you have a, have you ever seen this kind of turtles in where you live? He said, nope, absolutely not. But then I found a turtle right right in his backyard after some search. So this kind of turtle, this this species turtle is the turtle that you do miss uh, quite easily. So that is the common mass turtle. It's uh, one of the smallest turtle, one of the cutest turtles, I would say. It's about the size of a hand at maximum. So it is entirely aquatic also. Of course, it's also listed as a species of concern. So they do not, the last, the, sorry, the last, the lack air basking behavior. Uh, they do not bask in the air. They, they, they are typically aquatic. Uh, they have this uh, aquatic lifestyle. It's almost like a fish. So they do not come out of water Unless you go into the water, as, as I said before, you do snorkel, you might come across one of the turtle uh, if you're lucky enough. So this turtle have this cryptic lifestyle. So their distribution is potentially underestimated uh, given, our, given our current effort of serving this turtle. Okay. So next I'm gonna show you the distribution of the turtle. So this is the global range of the turtle uh, showing right here. So it's pretty, pretty wide distributed uh, all the way from California, sorry, Florida to Southern Ontario. Uh, in our region particularly, so the gray area is documented, uh, is like official documented range of the species and the red dots are records uh, that is uh, coming from Natural Heritage, Heritage Information Center, which is the government, excuse me, is a governmental agency in, in, in Ontario that record uh, species occurring, uh, occurrences of rare species and species of conservation concern. So this database incorporates uh, citizen science uh, uh, spots and also observations by scientists and also surveys, uh, surveys dedicated to certain species. So this is accumulated records from that database. So you can see there are some of the records already are beyond where uh, we document the species to be. Okay. So on the base of this, this knowledge, I set up to in the, in the three summers and so to, from 2017 to 2019, I went out from Kinson, uh, which is around here, all the way to almost to uh, Algonquin Provincial Park, which is around somewhere here. So I, I set out to survey various water bodies across, this, across the landscape, covering both areas that we know the mass turtle are, are present and also two places where we have no records of these turtles whatsoever in those regions. So I surveyed around 150 sites uh, through the time and compared to the known records of, of, of turtles, about 380. And also I took, just to know that I had took another five samples along the Gatineau River all the way to the north where serves almost like a negative control because we don't think there will be any turtles living up to those uh, latitudes. So here you're showing some pictures where, so of my describing the typical uh, day of my field work, we set up to put a canoe on top of my my little uh, uh, cross country SUV, the small car. Uh, then you set up your your filtration lab uh, at the back of your trunk. Sometimes you get into a ditch, uh, can't get yourself out, and then 30 minutes later, uh, middle of nowhere, there's a guy off driving a pickup truck, uh, got me out of the, the desperation. Uh, so all, uh, after all this fun of field work. Here's the result. I'm sorry for the color that might be confusing, but on, confus confusing, but on the right side, uh, I have detections in uh, color by red and non-detections colored by black. So I did find a lot of detections where, uh, where we know turtles are, are present by the NHIC database. And also I found a lot of detections where we have no knowledge whatsoever before, before, before this survey. So I have, around 100 uh, detections of environmental DNA samples and around 50 of them are non-detections. So with this, uh, I was about, I, I, was, I was on my way to do the modeling. So since we, now we have currencies of the turtle with a better, uh, was also with the help with the environmental DNA detections. So how can we model uh, their occurrences across the landscape? So just a little bit mathematical modeling here. I'm not gonna go into details of course, save you guys the joy from the talk. Uh, so just like all of us have our own niche in our society that 
every living organism had their have, have, have has its, its an ecological niche in the environment. So niche modeling is the model that trying to relate or trying to find a relationship between species occurrences and environmental conditions. So they're trying to find the, the relationship between the two aspects. And uh, what it requires is the presence data uh, for the species of, of your interest. And then the, uh, the environmental variables that might have uh, uh, impacts on the, on the presence of the, of, the, of the species you're looking at. So what essentially niche modeling will tell you uh, is the predicted distribution of presence given, given the, the, the data you put into, and then tells you what environmental conditions might determine the distribution of, of the species you're looking at across the landscape. So what was the really, what was the, what's the environmental variable that actually matters that actually can dictate where the species will be and will not be. So just in, just kind of uh, narrow down to kind of distill the, the, the region I'm, I did my modeling. So I actually did two modeling in the, in the, in the smaller geographical scale and also to a larger geographical scale. But today, uh, for the sake of time, I'll show you the, the results from the larger scale. So this is the Southern Ontario, uh, where I utilize the DNA, uh, the data, the, the occurrences data from both uh, the NHIC dataset and also my eDNA detections. So here, just a quick overview of the, the environmental variables I put into the model. So all together, I compiled 40 different uh, environmental variables, including uh, such as temperature related, uh, related variables, precipitation related variables, and landscaper, uh, landscape types like such as farm, forest, wetlands, and water bodies and also some, uh, some variables related to the shoreline development, such as wetlands and, uh, and elevational uh, variables. Altogether, I have 40 variables put into the model. The model will choose uh, which variables are most important to the distribution of this turtle. So first, I'm gonna show you the results of the predicted presence of this turtle. So here's the predicted results, predicted distribution of common mass turtles across landscape uh, in southern Ontario, uh, where the warmer color indicates higher probability of uh, presence, and the, the darker color uh, indicates lower lower probability. So we can see that there's a huge, uh, sorry, around the, the the mountains of Algonquin Park, there's a you can see this nice warm color of high probability of distribution. Uh, but if we zoom in, in this area. That's where I found a lot of my detections that has not been documented by previous data sets. So if we zoom in, so on the left side, we have uh, the occurrences from NHIC data set. So this model was built only on the NHIC data set. So this model predict that there will, there will be total presences in those areas indicated by the warmer color. And then coincidentally, or I would say, excitedly that my eDNA detection sprite uh, lied uh, perfectly right on top of the, those, those places that are predicted to be high probability of pre turtle presence by the model that only use NHIC data set. So in the sense that eDNA uh, detections kind of confirmed where we are supposed to find the turtles. And on the other side, as I mentioned, we can also tell uh, what kind of environmental variables is actually de determining where turtles are. So to save all the details of the analysis, here's some take home message, uh, results from the analysis. The first is thermal conditions of turtles. So namely annual mean temperature and the mean temperature during the summertime. So there's a very, there, was, there, there was a very clear positive relationship between the thermal conditions and the probability of distribution. So if you have higher, temperature, you will have higher probability. That, that's related to the growth and reproduction. That is so because summertime is the peak time of their activity. So turtles will utilize this time as much as they could for growth and, rep and reproduction. So this is very important. And the second one is elevation. So higher elevation means lower probability of turtles. So that, that comes in, in, in several aspects, but the most obvious uh, story here is that because uh, mass turtle, they are, they are pretty aquatic and their ability to move overland is pretty bad. So they're really not a turtle that you, you can compare to a snapping turtle that can roam uh, on, on the road for, for, for kilometers. Uh, mass turtle are really not good at that. So higher elevation simply means 
a geographical barrier that prevents turtle to occupy. So okay, that that we saw from the from the, the map I showed before that in the central in the cent central Algonquin Park region where the mountains are, there are very little uh, presence of mass turtle. And also the lake size or the that the kind of the characteristic. Uh, the the phys physiological characteristic of the, of the wetland of the water body is also very important. We can see this this behavior of almost like an optimum in the middle, that too small of a lake or too large of a lake are not favorable by the mass turtle. That can be explained that if you have a very small water body, the water tends to be shallow. As I mentioned before, that even though in the summertime it, it could be very uh, productive uh, with a lot of uh, wetland uh, with a lot of food to uh, forage opportunities for the for the for the turtles, but in the sun in the winter time, because the water is too shallow, they hold very little uh, heat. Uh, so they will they will freeze to the bottom, providing uh, no hibernation site for turtle. On the other side, if you if the lake is too big, the the lake tend to be, tend to be very deep, and also the chances of a, a well developed uh, wetland will be will be will be will be, will be, will be uh, lower. So that will also that, so in, on that side, it will provide it will provide less opportunity for summer uh, habitat and foraging grounds. So turtles seem to the master seem to be prefer uh, mid-sized lakes such as Lake Pinnacum. There's a huge population of master in Lake Pinnacum. And finally, we have some some uh, some uh, sorry variable that acting as a as a threshold. So this one is very interesting. It's the summer rain, uh, summer precipitation. So at a certain point. Uh, if you if the summer precipitation ex exists certain amount there will be no turtles at all that that is some 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 of the some variables you would you would, you would look into that that means this this variable is thresholding the distribution of turtles across the landscape so one of the reason to one of the explanations on on this excuse me uh, could be the risk of nest flooding in the summertime. So we know this turtle, uh, although they are in, in, almost entirely aquatic, uh, the only time they'll actually come out come out of water to get into the terrestrial environment is, is during the mating season, where the female uh, turtles will try to lay eggs. They dig nest uh, in, in, in a gravel and sandy area, and then uh, lay eggs in those in those in, in, in the nest. So if you have a lot of summer summer precipitation, uh, there's a risk of uh, flooding of the nest, which will uh, hinder the survivorship of the hatchlings, uh, which thus might pre uh, prevent the turtles from occupying the area. So with all this, I would like to conclude and make some implications of, 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 of my, my studies. So novel techniques such as environmental DNA continue, uh, they will continue to, to assist with conservation uh, biology, helping us better survey the animals of interest. Um, and also then contribute to the turtle conservation and the distribution of turtles in southern Ontario. They are constrained by various environment, environmental factors, as I mentioned in previous slides, such as temperature, elevation, and also conditions of wetlands and characteristics of the lake. And what we can do as a, what I would also, what I would try to deliver the message to the community, what we can do to help to, to, to the conservation of turtles uh, there, there are many simple things you can do. Drive slowly, drive carefully, especially during the during the summertime where turtles start to move around. They're trying to cross a road, so stop for turtles for sure. Uh, help turtles across the road, like like what I did for this uh, snapping turtle. It's it's not really particularly happy of me assisting, but if you come across turtles trying to cross the road, try to help them from where they are facing. If they're facing from one side to the other side of the road, try your best to help them to, to cross, but be careful with the snapping turtles because they will snap you uh, if you're not careful enough. Uh, protect the, the lake and wetland, as I mentioned before, the, the wetland is really, really important uh, for the survival of turtles, especially during, during the summertime. And, uh, and also, as I mentioned, the hibernation side during the winter, if, because turtles are map turtles, as we know of, are hibernating along the shoreline. So during shoreline development, you want to take extra caution not only during summertime but also think about winter time whether this area is critical for winter for turtles to hibernate uh, during winter time so i already spent a lot of uh, spent a lot of your time i'm gonna end the end my talk with a thank you slide thank you for my to my to my supervisor uh to all the people that helped with my field work and to random 
uh, friendly Canadian that helped me with my, my service. So this, this, this gentleman particularly offered to drive me across the lake so I don't have to do any canoe at the time. And also the previous guy who saved me from my saved me from from the ditch of the car uh, that that where I drive, drove my car into 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 a, into a map into <laughs> into a ditch. And uh, with that, I would like to take questions. And that's the first time I learned how to portage. I've got a question if uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, first of all, I want to say really good job, Wensi. Uh, I, I really liked your talk. Uh, I'm a, a master's student at McMaster University and I'm doing a project on eDNA as well. And so cool. I thought this was really, really cool work. It's, it's groundbreaking. And uh, especially your GIS modeling, I thought that was incredible. Uh, I thought it was brilliant. Um, Thank you. Thank you. But uh, yeah, yeah, I had a question. Um, with your sampling, um, just like, do you know what what sort of like uh, stuff did you use? Did you use like a precision biomonitoring uh, or like Osmos for the water, or like did you suck up water and then filter it? Like, yeah. So I skip all those details to to save time for for questions. Yeah, no, no, no that's fine. Yeah, but typically what I when I did for my winter, both of my winter and summer sampling, what you did is actually quite simple, where you 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 prepare a whole bunch of Nalgene, uh clean sterilized uh, bottles. So you go and dip the water, uh, kind of scoop the water from the surface. Where then oh, we okay. had a, we had a portable peristaltic pump. It's a big black, sorry, big blue uh, metal box where the pump has a battery, so it can run in the field. So basically, we filter the water right. through a, uh, a polycarbon. 1.2 micron filter. So basically right. you filter yeah. water. You, you Was preserve. that like made by a specific company, like precision biomonitoring or or uh, oh, so you know? I think we bought the filters from Sterilac. So if okay. you want yeah, if you want more details, uh, you can send me emails. I can send you my sampling protocols whatsoever. You can you can take right. a look at it. So if you if you just started your 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 work, I'm happy to provide suggestions. Yeah, we've done a bit of sampling, uh, but yeah. yeah, that would actually be great. Um, do you know how many liters? This is my last question, but do you know how many liters you filtered? Yeah, so typically we filter one liter of water okay. sample per site. And right. uh, that kind of like is the more almost like standard volume for right. across the literature. And one thing I do want to mention that uh, depends on your, your, your environments, you might, have, you, might, you might have water that is really turbid. Where, yeah, yeah, and that's that's where, what we've we've found. Uh, we're doing Blanding's turtles, um, well, and they're the, they're mostly in bogs where we're doing it, and so it's a lot more turbid, and we we've yeah, been so having a little more trouble with that. But yeah, so I I, I came across turbid water, then I actually used at, le at most like five different filters. So I filter the water in five segments. So basically, oh, okay, if the water is cool. clear, I can go with one go. If the water is really turbid, I have to spend an hour. Actually, right. that, but, yeah. but just to keep everything in the in the same volume, I, I typically do one one liter per site. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. No worries. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Those yeah. yeah. Feel free to email me. Was yeah. Both your sure. All right. Um, we have some other questions in the chat. So um, one was asked, did you do any surveys around Denison Island on Pinacon? This is the small island due east of Eight Acre Island. So uh, actually, I, I don't think I heard the name of this island. Uh, so do you, do you mean the winter time or summer time? Um, they didn't ask the season, but either, they said either. So I, I can't say it for sure. I'm just going to take a look at where, uh, because my, my, my slides are pretty big. My, my computer is frozen right now. Uh, but. I, I don't think I typically come across that particular site. In the winter time, we might we might actually cover that area. Give me one second. I'm gonna put out that slide. Yeah. So if you can point out the island to me, that would be great. I'm just gonna move to Lake Pentagon. Sorry, it's getting slow. So you mean this island or or that one? Yeah, sorry, I I don't really know the the name of the island. Yeah, so this one. This one, yeah. 
Yeah, so in the winter time, we I don't think I went that far at the time. So I I did a lot of service, including visual service, where I drew a lot of holes just right on top of where turtles are hibernating. I saw them. Uh, I, we did a lot of around this island. So this one is pretty, it's kind of far from. And also remember that in the winter time, I have to walk, dragging all my equipment, for walking from across the lake. It took a lot of time. And also, there's one other risk. At the time, I think doing my sampling, this because it's closer to to the Rideau Canal, the water here is actually already open, so it's kind of risky to to venture over that side. But I won't. I would not be surprised just 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 from gut feeling, if a small island like this, and if there's a rocky slope, uh, there will be turtles. Uh, there could be turtles in those areas because kind of from the observations that the map turtles seems to be seems to be uh, uh, hibernating in the in the in the rocky slope. My suspicion is uh, first the rocky rocky bottom they will not consume a lot of oxygen during the winter time because we know in the winter time if you have a shallow water a lot of vegetation that start to de decompose the oxygen will be will be will be consumed right. So if you have a rocky bottom there will be less decomposition decomposition happening. And also, if there's a slope, the ice is, is the, the thickness of the ice is changing through the winter. So the, the, the turtle will have some leeway to adjust the position. If you have a really flat bottom, the turtle's right there. What if the ice is coming against the shell? The turtles will have no place to go. So if you have a, have a slope, then the turtles might be able to come up and down to, just depending on how much, how much space the turtles have uh, to, the, to the bottom of the ice. That's my suspicion. And also, uh, around this island is not only the good habitat for the winter hibernation site, but also in the summer, uh, there are tons of map uh, 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 around the island. And also, 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 <laughs> uh, the, the colleague of mine, Greg Bolton, Carlton University, Carlton University, he discovered that map are quite uh, loyal to the site. So if they start off at the site when they're young uh, during, on this island, they will keep coming back to the, to the same site over the winter. So there's a fatality uh, in the hibernation side as well. So there are many, many aspects of this, uh, this, this unique behavior. Yeah. Amazing. I hope that answered the question, yeah. Yeah, um, the next person, Allison said, great research and congratulations. How difficult is it to collect samples? For example, how deep do you have to sample to detect? Also, how long can Etna survive in Ontario lakes? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great, that's, that's those are great questions. That's very uh, kind of basic questions you will ask if you want to do any eDNA studies. Uh, so the first uh, first question, how difficult it is to collect samples? Collect samples, uh, if you can do canoeing, you can, you can do boating, that, that's not too, too difficult. Uh, and also I, 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 I need to, I want to clarify that most people doing environmental DNA study, they want to snapshot the presence of absence of certain species. So that also go back, goes to your to the to the third question you have. The DNA eDNA typically survives around in the summertime, okay? Uh, around two, three weeks. That's a consensus that DNA will, will if if animal enter this area, leave some trace of DNA into the environment, that typically we say the detection window is about two weeks from that point. So after that point, DNA will be too degraded, uh, degraded, degraded to be detected. So if if I go to a place where I just want to see whether I want to know whether a turtle has been here in the past two weeks ish, then I took surface water sample that kind of reflects the most most recent or most uh, most recent uh, sig signals of turtles since and also because in the summertime turtles are typically in the shallow water area. So if I go to a place where uh, the water is about a 1.2 1.5 or two meters deep, I just take water samples from the surface, which will be very easy to do if you're on a boat or a, or a canoe. Oh, I'd actually also answered the second question you had. So basically that's that's the, the procedure. And uh, I do want to kind of elaborate on that uh, is, is that because what I did for my PhD is almost like one man army. I had my assistant, but what, I, what we can do at our best is to drive to a lake on a map that looks, looks all right for turtles and try to ask permission, start to knock on doors for people. Can I go to your backyard? I want to get you to the lake because you know a lot of places are private. So that took a lot of time and also takes a lot of courage. Not, not all people are, are welcoming as, as, you, uh, as you would assume. I have people with guns and shooting snakes while doing the sampling. I mean, that guy just hates snakes, just obvious, uh, just ridiculous. But 
but there's there's a there's a there's an ongoing trend in this in the environment DNA field is to try to use a robot to do sampling for us. So there's one lab in our in our department, Dr. Yushan Wang's lab. They were trying to use a UAVs where you fly the UAVs on top of a lake, then just drop a bottle, then take the water sample for you. So imagine if you can can utilize a fleet of drones just to swarm to the lake and take samples back to you. That would be that would be a dream, right? So so I think I think there's a lot of lot of lot of opportunities and a lot of a long way to go to to the to the to advance this technique. But I, I hope that that can answer this question. It depends on how many people and how much how much money and how <laughs> how 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 many how many tools you have to do the sampling. Yeah. Wenji, someone kind of elaborated and asked whether the open water would be good for hibernating or if that open water area affects hibernating. Oh, so you mean uh, uh, hibernating not where the, the, the lake is, is frozen? So mm -hmm. that's actually a really good question. I kind of, I always, that, that, that actually go to the core of the hibernation side of the, the turtle, why turtles are hibernating over there. It, it is because there are enough oxygen. Uh, so there's one unique unique uh, thing about Lake Pentagon is because Lake Pentagon never get entirely frozen. So that actually there's a window, right? There there's a there's open water in the lake. That actually there's a there's a gas exchange, right? There the oxygen can get into the lake from those open areas. So to answer the question whether the turtles were, were hibernating in those areas. I would say probably not because if you if you take a look or if you if you go there in the summertime, it's really muddy and there's a lot of vegetation along the uh, the, the canal and the water tends to be shallow. Uh, those environments probably not going to be ideal for for the map turtles as I described before. But I do suspect that the oxygen can gain into the lake from those open the waters. So that actually in the hole uh, for the lake might might be really good for turtles. I don't know. And also uh, and also Lake Pentagon is a quiet is is of a it's of a considerable size, so maybe maybe the water the, the lake would just hold enough oxygen uh, from 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 summer and autumn, so they will they will they will last the turtles for the winter. I would imagine if you have a smaller smaller lake or a pond, uh, you have enough depth, but if it got entirely uh, frozen, then the, the oxygen will not will not will not last long enough for turtles. Yeah, so that's my 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 thought on open water. In terms of hibernating. Cool. Okay, someone else asked, how common is using eDNA sampling to do this kind of research, or are other methods like robotic cameras more common to use? You mean looking for turtles under the ice? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I am the one of the first people to use environmental DNA, so not a lot of people have been conducting eDNA in the winter time, so because eDNA, as we think of, is pretty, uh, it's not like it's it's not something you can just 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 do it because in the summer we always go into in the summertime because summer things are more active. They're releasing more DNA into the water. The 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 the, the one of the biggest concern of conducting eDNA studies in the winter time is whether the turtles will, will be releasing enough DNA into the water. First, they are they're hibernating. They are not doing doing much. Second, they are reptiles. Reptiles, they have concealed skin. The skin is not per permeable compared to us or compared to a fish. That skin, that have mucus release a lot of DNA. So reptiles and hibernating, they might not even release enough DNA to be to be detected. So I, I think I showed you in one graph that even at where we, turtles are hibernating, I only have 50-50 chance of detecting uh, the turtle. So a lot of challenges. I think this is one of the study uh, studies actually use eDNA in the winter time and robotic cameras. I have not been seeing a lot of them uh, using this in literature or in academia. There are people playing with this, trying to search things on, under the water. But the the the, the thing about uh, using the robotic cameras under the ice or in water in general is uh, is navigation. There's no GPS signals under, under in the water, so. It really depends on your skill to drive. That you just have to take reference that you see on the bottom of the lake. Uh, it's really easy to get get lost under the water, and also because the the there's no wireless connection between your robot to your controller, you have to use a tether, and a tether can get tangled by 
things in the water. So I don't think I don't think there's a lot of people using this for academia purposes, but there are people playing this uh, playing a robotic thing in the water, water for sure. Yeah. Okay. Someone asked. They the same person said this is fascinating. Thank you. Um, Kathy asked, "Do you look? Did you look for only turtle DNA, or did you also detect DNA from other animals? And were there any surprises?" Yeah. So. The DNA, the DNA can can be used used to detect many different species as as you wish. Uh, my study, I only focused on map turtles at the time. Uh, to tell you, I to, to confess, actually, I designed a study to detect mask turtle. But then I found it really hard. I cannot confirm whatever I find because we have no previous knowledge of of mask turtle in the lake, and uh, mask turtles, mask turtle, they are not hybrided in groups. So it will be even harder to find them. And also sometimes, according to the literature, musk turtle, when they're hibernate, they actually bury, them, bury themselves or half bury themselves into the mud. So there's no, I actually learned how to scuba dive uh, in the wintertime. I tried once, it's not really something I can do <laughs> constantly trying to look for them. So I kind of switched, so I, okay, I, but then somebody told me, Greg knows where map turtles are hibernating. So I asked Greg, can you show me where turtles that are happening. I have my samples. I have my, my, my primers and stuff. I can detect them. So but he said, you do that first and then I'll tell you where turtles are. So then I kind of like switch from one turtle to the other. Uh, so, so, but that, that, that kind of limit myself, my study only on that specific turtles. But, but yes, I, 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 I totally agree that this technique can be utilized for many other species. I mean, turtles are happening and fish are in the lake all around a year, so it will be it will be a good uh, kind of good good project to look for them in the winter time, and also for something like mud puppies, we have absolutely no idea where they are, even in the summertime. So 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 I think there's a lot of promises in this technique, especially in the winter time. This kind of unique situation where the conventional methods are really really kind of useless. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. Can can you use eDNA to do population sizes, or is it only presence absence? Like, can you get individual DNA markers, or is it just the species? Yes, that's a <laughs> that's a really good and big question. Uh, I think ninety nine percent of the eDNA studies are presence absence. Sometimes they go into uh, semi abundance, just because the DNA eDNA is at this point is still like a black box where you go into the water, you took a water sample, you try to use your primer because whenever you are, you're trying to detect DNA in the water, you are trying to target a one specific region of the DNA, right? If you are talking at that, you, are, you, are, you cannot be sure that whether you're missing somewhere else. So it's really hard to make exclusive conclusions of what I'm gonna detect in the water. So that goes to the question, uh, it's really hard to get a big enough segment to do any genetics because if you want to do genetics, the the the, the target the, the target sequence you, you that you have has to have certain length. But in eDNA, first DNA degraded, and also the DNA simply cannot we cannot get enough DNA to do that kind of study. But if you do in that intensively, you might be able to do it. And also depends on the species. For turtles, I, I doubt that. But for fish. In the peak time of their activity, you might get a lot of DNA, especially in the spawning spawning mm -hmm. uh, season. You have tons of DNA in the water for sure. You might be able to do that, but it really depends on the system, and depends on the question. I think there there are a few studies uh, that tried to do genetics on 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 the on the on one of the shark in the Middle East, but not. I think it's definitely a a, a worthwhile kind of try. But I think but I, I still think there's a there's some technology technological hinders on that. So, I mean, 10 years ago, people, people are now using environment DNA, not, 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 not as much as today. So as, as long as we are progressing, so at a certain point, I'm, I will not be surprised if people can do genetics using environment DNA. Environmental genetics, I don't know. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have. Oh, no, there's another one. 
um, Tara wrote, I had heard that turtles do not shed as much eDNA, which makes it more difficult to get hits from sampling. Where were there challenges with going to known positive sites and not getting hits? I imagine this is why eastern musk turtles were a good choice due to making due to being highly aquatic and more common than blandings, for example. Yes, that's a that you, you, you guessed my mind. So at the very beginning, I said there are five species of turtles in this region. I designed assays for all of them. Uh, I think one of the two species we wanted to look at is mass turtle and blended turtle. Uh, mass turtle, for obvious reasons, they are aquatic. They are easy to 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 to, to miss uh, during service and blended turtle because blended turtles are semi-terrestrial. They move from environments from uh, water bodies to water bodies during summertime. They are not stick stick to one one lake uh, like other turtles. Uh, but yes, mass turtles are easier to detect compared to other turtles. I do not have much success detecting other turtles. Um, although they work perfectly in the lab, but in the environmental samples, they are the, the detection probability is really low. So I think for turtles, it's kind of a tricky because as 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 you 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 know for sure that turtles do not shed as much as other 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 species. And uh, that's also probably the reason there are lot there are not a lot of eDNA studies on turtles. Most of them are on fish and other um, salamanders. Those those species they have permeable skin, they release mucus uh, into the environments. But turtles are kind of hard and mass turtles are easier because they're aquatic and also because they're smaller. Uh, their their metabolic rate seems to be higher, and also because they're smaller, so their surface to body uh, volume ratio is larger. So the exchange between their internal environments and external environments are faster. That's more eDNA in the water. So I I, I kind of think one on uh, one side, mass turtles are are probably underestimated uh, in, in terms of distribution. On the other side, it's easier compared to other turtles. So yes, other turtles will be will be harder to 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 study. There's one. There's one. Just remember, there's one uh, study looking at all these turtle species using environmental DNA detections, but it was in a pond. So, in a in an artificial pond, they 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 have been success, successful. But I I would imagine in a uh, in a real in a, in a real world settings will be much much harder. Yeah. Awesome. Tara said great points. Very intriguing study. Or thank very you. interesting study, intriguing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think Sabrina might share her yes. screen again. Um, so, oh yeah, Lindsay has to share her screen again. Um, for you all go, we just want to hear from you once more. We have one last poll to do. These were wonderful questions. That it was great. Um, thanks, Wendy. No I, uh, I I loved the the discussion we had after. This was awesome. Yeah, no problem. I'm gonna mute myself though. Excellent. All right, I'm going to end the poll. So thanks everyone for for giving me your your thoughts at the end. That's really useful for us when we're planning um, planning new new things. Yeah, and also if you didn't get a chance to donate and want to, we will be putting the link in the chat. Sabrina, do you want, or Lindsay, do you want to go ahead and talk about our upcoming events? 
Yeah, um, so we have some upcoming events, uh, Rethinking Our Science, that will be happening on April 12th. And it looks like all of you or most of you have learned something from this event. So it looks so it'd be great to see you all in our next upcoming events as well. Hopefully you can take away more from those. And we have our Earth Day events as well happening later in April with the 22nd. Just to add on to that, um, the Earth Day events do have recommended grade levels, but anyone of any age is welcome to attend any of them. Everything okay, Sabrina? Yeah, everything looks good. Okay. Um, do you want to just wrap it up? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And we're so happy to see that you've taken something away from tonight. And hopefully, we'll see you at our upcoming events as well, where you can learn more about um, the different events we'll be having and those information as well. Thanks so much, Wenji, for um, taking the time out of your day to come talk to us. I feel like I learned a lot about turtles. Um, so that was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Wenji. It was fascinating. I loved it. Thank you, guys. And thanks, everyone, for joining and listening in. I, uh, the, the positive chat responses are, are, are just flooding in. So that's really great. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. And I really hope you guys can join us for another one of our events. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, and um, if you missed it or if you want to share this, this will be recorded and, and posted on our social media as well. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why do you